We rolling? Yeah. Trevor, you're famous for disassembling band's tracks and you were the first guy probably to, to take a song apart and redo it to your own template with a rhythm machine, synths, ABC. What, yeah. what prompted you to do that rather than taking the normal at the time route of using session guys to replace the parts straight to tape? What was the driver to make you fiddle about with those early TR-808s and so on? Well, if you... Yeah, TR-808, yeah, God, that's a... Well, at the beginning of the 80s, there was some great new technology available that hadn't been available before. And uh, the idea of being able... I mean, there were drum machines in, in the 70s, but they were very limited. You know, I think the, the, the drum machine that we used to use was called a Mini Pops Junior, and it had about three different rhythms. As I remember, we played the backing track of Video Killed the Radio Star to a Mini Pops Junior. Uh, when the 808 first came out, it was like a programmable version of a Mini Pops Junior, and I had it hooked up to uh, I had it hooked up to some Simmons drum modules that Dave Simmons had uh, modified for me, and he'd given me he'd put extra outs on a on the 808 drum machine. Um, so it's a techie magazine, so people are interested in this kind of stuff. Was, so I had I think I had the first 808 that came into England, or one of the first batch definitely and Dave Simmons put these triggers on the side and I used those triggers to fire off a set of Simmons drums but I, but I also managed to to uh, lock the whole thing to a, a very primitive Roland sequencer that took lists of notes oh, yeah. <laughs> so that even I could operate it and then you triggered the list of lists of notes or I triggered it with a cowbell from the 808 so I could I could I could make a rhythm section, you know, and and uh, when I said a sequencer, I I had a very early mini Moog with the CV and gate on the back of it, and the Roland sequencer operated the CV and gate. So I suppose I you know I had a I had what would be considered a very early rig, you know. Back then, producers didn't have their own rigs. Producers no. just showed up at a studio. You didn't even have your own engineer most of the time. No. Um, because I caused havoc by uh, with in you know my wife's um, owned my wife's family owned Sam East and uh, after I'd been working there for a little while I nicked the engine main engineer and that, that caused a fair amount of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, you Gary were... Langan. Yeah. So <laughs> they weren't very happy about that, but it was the way things were going, you know. Um, but to be able to program a rhythm section was something really new, and I think I think the way that the way that uh, the way that that worked for someone like ABC was it, it worked incredibly well for them because they played the first the first track I did with them was Poison Arrow and, and and they played it I mean they were all good players but when they finished playing it uh, I said to them do you want this is this good enough for you or do you want it better than this and they said we want it as good as it can possibly be and how can you make it better than this and so I said well I can program the rhythm section. Uh, and if I program the rhythm section exactly and lay it down on tape, then if you play on top of it, you know, um, be like painting by numbers, and then we take it away. And that's we did the first track like that, and it worked so well. It became the sort of way that we operated for most of that record. Although, yeah. although we did get a really good bass player, so we didn't need that. Sorry, you've got a problem with your phone? <laughs> no, that's all right. It's my backup recording. Oh, right, right. Yes. Sorry. The backup recording oh. technology. Is that the kind of, is that the question you, because no, when you were saying I was the first person that took somebody's song apart. Yeah. I, you know, I, I. And reassembled it. And reassembled it. Yeah, well, you know, the uh, ABC were, were, were cool because they let me do stuff. And uh, even, even back then it was possible to edit songs, you know, the two inch tape, you could make a copy and edit another middle eight onto it if you wanted or something and I did a few I did that a few times on Lexicon of Love length of the tracks mainly lengthening them when they got better you know if a bit came up that was so good well let's have this bit twice you know that kind of thing yes I mean you mentioned your team I was as a young recording engineer I was completely sort of flabbergasted when the horn team came to a studio that I worked in and you you were doing um 
You're doing Malcolm McLaren's Duck Rock. Oh, right. Now, I suppose I should have been watching Gary, but I was just completely riveted by the way that you were working with the Fairlight, mm-hmm. playing your bass, having fun, just mucking about, it looked like to me, and then, uh, you know, finding the little snippet that you wanted. And uh, Wow. Which studio was that? Not, wasn't that was R.G. Jones. R. G. You, Jones. You'd had a flood at Psalm. Oh, right, right. And you needed oh. another place with an SSL for a... A brief period. Did we have the world's famous Supreme team there in Michael McLaren, or not? You had all the tapes. You'd recorded them in in, oh, in the yeah. States. And yeah. Malcolm was there with a huge case of recordings of various <laughs> various people that you'd run into yeah, or met. Yeah. And that, that was the other thing that completely struck me, was the way you were taking all these tiny snippets of information, just some guy going... Gah, 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 into a microphone, and somehow... Creating this thing, it seemed like you'd been parachuted in from Mars because... Yeah, well, a lot of people didn't know what was going on in the early 80s. You know, if you try and explain a Fairlight to somebody, you know, to Digital Mellotron, yeah. you know, people didn't really know what, what, what you meant. Uh, and, I mean, I never really understood how a Fairlight worked, but I understood what it did. Yeah. Um, uh, so lots of people were... Yeah, you're right. There was, there was a wonderful period of about four or five years... Where the technology was so expensive, you had to be you had to be sort of successful to get it. Yeah. And so it kept it kept the riffraff out. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I'm being facetious. But uh, it 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 was you know I used to try and explain it to me. I tried to explain it to the world's famous Supreme team. They were guys that scratched records. You know, I said, well, you know, you guys scratch the record, a record. But look, with this Fairlight, we can amazing things we could do. And I saw their eyes glaze over. They weren't interested. But um, and there was something new every week. I mean, the first time we ever locked a Fairlight to uh, to a drum machine, yeah, you know, page hour on a Fairlight. That's when we did Relax. It was uh, it was a thing called the conductor that Psycho Systems brought out. Yeah. <laughs> God knows what it was. I mean, the, the conductor sort of locked everything together, and that was a new thing, being able to lock things. Yeah. Not that it was particularly reliable. But. I mean, Peter Vogel and Kim Ryrie for. F- Fairlight, they they didn't really think of the machine as a sampler. They it was it was you who made it into a sampler because I I worked with other people who who were just using it as a musical instrument. So I mean, oh right, yeah, you know, yeah. So I never spoke to anybody from Fairlight ever. I just uh, I no one ever no. spoke to me. I paid the full whack for it. In fact, I've generally been like that mostly with manufacturers because. It's you know you can get sidetracked if you yeah you know, well uh, in, into you know into those kind of things, but I do remember the day before I bought the Fairlight getting a phone call from a guy called Brad Naples who ran Sinclavier at the time, who did a whole sales pitch to me saying, you know if you're looking for gimmicks then the Fairlight's the thing for you, but if you're looking for a serious scientific instrument then you should buy the Sinclavier, <laughs> and saying to well I'm actually I'm looking for gimmicks I'm a record producer so I'm going to buy the Fairlight, and. Uh, I did it. I did subsequently buy a Synclavier, but I, I must say that the Synclavier was the single biggest waste of money in my whole career. Um, $260,000. I mean, we used it. It was great. At the time, it was the only thing that did what it did. But uh, once, once, the quali- once sampling, once the quality became sort of normal, sampling sort of lost its fun aspect you know the fairlight you put something in the fairlight it came out sounding slightly different it was yeah. romanticized yes. in some sort of way <laughs> but the 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 synclavier was perfect quality so it kind of it felt more like a recording and you no longer had the crunchy no, sound no, to it, I, uh, and it was no fun anymore you know in the same sort of way so because somebody was asking me what do you think of sampling and i was the uh, about six months ago, I said, well, it's a stupid question. Everything's a sample these days. So, yeah. yeah. So on the the kind of production work you did that followed those early stuff, like, for example, Grace Jones, mm-hmm. Slave to the Rhythm, that was seen as a bit of a departure by us studio wonks at the time. It seemed like you were doing something very sort of Steely Dan-like or, or groovy, and we speculated about... How much of that was programmed or not, or how much Louis had played, or well, the inter- uh, slave to the rhythm. The interesting thing about slave to the rhythm is really Steve Lipson, because uh, uh, Steve Lipson was, uh, made up a two-bar drum loop 
with two Sonys. We found, you know, we, we, we had a go-go band in. Uh, they were all like the top stars from the go-go world, you know. I think it was the drummer from... Uh, um, percussion players from EU, Experience Unlimited. And the drummer was a guy called Juju, who was from uh, the guys that did that tune Money. Anyway, but they couldn't remember arrangements. <laughs> And, uh, I mean, they, literally, they couldn't. The idea of an arrangement, you, you start here and you stop there. Yeah. They just played. And uh, so and we, we were trying to record the song with them playing it, but it was hopeless, really. Um, but we had this little bit of a jam that they did before we started trying to show them the arrangement. We had a, a jam, and it was, it was really... The feel of this particular jam was really good. Um, and Steve took two bars of it, and he made up, you know, he made up five minutes of two bars of this uh, uh, drummer. I think I think it was made in a few pieces, but we were at, at that time we were. Well, Steve was pretty hot with the two Sonys, you know. Yeah. He could do just about anything with them, and we we just did them with simply offsets. And I say we, if Steve did them, you know, I was around, um, and made up this sort of two-bar drum loop, and then we slotted uh, drum fills into it. And then we slotted eight bars of the guy actually playing freely in the middle of it. The middle where she says, don't cry, it's only the rhythm. Yeah. Is the guy playing. He was a wonderful drummer. It's a very difficult part to play, actually. So it was a bit of a departure because it was sort of as though it were programmed, but it had the sound quality of a beautiful recording. So that was quite new. It was quite tough to play with. Louis Jardin played the bass part on it. He didn't play the drums on it. He didn't even play the percussion on it. Oh, really? He might have played a little bit, but he played a great bass part. Yeah. Right? And uh, and I remember Louis saying, oh, it's took me 20 minutes to ever. It took him about eight hours because, <laughs> uh, in fact, the two-bar drum loop was slightly out of time. And you couldn't, you couldn't sort of lay back on it in the way that Louis was used to being able to lay back on something. So it took him a while, but it was a great piece of playing. It was worth persevering. Yeah, no, absolutely. It impressed us all. Yeah, yeah it was a, it was a, it was a great sounding record. Actually, had Slave to the Rhythm. I mean, it had its problems, but it, I, it still, to this day, it's one of the fav my favourite records. It had a made. silvery sheen that that seemed to us to be a departure. Yeah. When I say us, I mean Junior. Junior. Yes, no, no, it did. Tape what, it, what it had was it, it, it had some elements of hi-fi about it that, that previously I hadn't possibly Frankie didn't have much of that um, yes it did yeah, yes it, hadn't had that no no, no. no yes was analogue though yeah. you know Slate to the Rhythm was digital um, before we leave that thought mm. the guitar solo <coughs> like owner of a lonely heart oh, I, I have album. to know did it come from a fair light no 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 it's Trevor was, Rabin played yes. that it was one take one take apart from the last two notes. And one pan pot, I believe. Yeah, he was annoyed with me about that because uh, cause I was, uh, every time I used to play, I used to pan it and crank the reverb up on it. And then when he heard the final mix, he was really upset. He thought I was only doing that as a joke. <laughs> and I said, no, of course, I was always going to do it on the record. I used to do it every time we played the bloody thing back. You know? <laughs> but... Uh, no, no, it was what. It was funny that y there's a guy called Chris Squire who plays in Yes, and he's quite a character, Chris. And I remember when Trevor Rabin played that solo, Chris Squire wasn't there. And what happened was, Trevor said, "I've got an idea for a solo for that bit there. Um, let me show you what I mean. Uh, I'll put a fifth on the guitar, and he, 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 we had a harmonizer, and we put a fifth on the guitar for him. And then, and then, you know, it was the days of analog. We rolled the tape." And he played that guitar solo. He said, yeah, I think we should do something like that, but we should work on it. And I said, that's it, you just played it, it's brilliant. And he said, no, 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 we've, we've got to play it again. So anyway, we argued for about an hour uh, over it. And then he said, I said, OK, you can have one more go, but I'm keeping that one, right? You know, this wasn't the days of, you know, like, like now, you can do 30 solos and hundred solos but you can't you couldn't do that then we were on a slave reel we probably had one other track so he played the solo again and it was crap and I didn't like it anyway in the end I agreed to let him replace the last two notes in the solo 
and we had to punch them in on the on the solo, you know, and so they were gone. So we did that. I remember then just then Chris Squire arrived, and I said, "Check this guitar solo, Chris. You love it." And we played it, and Chris said, "I like it, but I don't like the last two notes." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, right, that's it. No, he's touching this. It's staying like that. <laughs> yeah, so it was one take. Yeah. Mm. I think Trevor Rabin said in one of his interviews, there's always a Trevor Horn stamp on his productions. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Mm, is, that, is that because you've got a vision in your mind of, of what you want music to communicate to somebody? You, you know when to erase, when to stop. Is, is there something in you that says, no, that's wrong? Have you got an idea? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I can, I can be convinced, you know. I don't, I, I'm not sort of died, you know, died in the wool. Sometimes, sometimes I don't like things and people say, you should like that, it's really good. And so I'll listen to it and try and like it. Because sometimes if you try and like something, you like it and you realise that you were just prejudiced against it. But I, I yeah, I'm, I'm sure I have... Uh, I have certain things I can't tolerate, you know. Well, no, I mean I can't, you know. I mean, I wouldn't say I had any great vision uh, in any in any way. I I think having a vision with music can sometimes be a damn nuisance because uh, you're much better off to take what comes along rather than trying to have a vision. Um, if you see what I mean, you know. If if you if you think something should be one way, and then the guys play it another way and it's better, then much better to go with that. I like things to be clear, and 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 I I mean I think pop music's a great form of communication, and whatever the artist's trying to communicate, I'd like to try and get that across. I think that's important, you know. Uh, maybe that's part of it. Yeah. You know, I come from a background of being a musician, but really I come from a background of being a dance band musician, rather than a rock and roll musician. I always found rock and roll as a sort of genre, very simple harmonically and quite tedious most of the time. Mm -hmm. Apart from, you know, people like Yes and, and you know, like you said, Steely Dan, I like, you know, I like, I would, they would be much more to my liking than, say, Black Sabbath, <laughs> who I can respect and I, you know, I can appreciate, but I wouldn't sort of listen to out of choice. I didn't even really like Ze Led Zeppelin until the 80s, yeah. until after they were finished, to be quite honest. And I've heard that as a musician, you have a rig that is a wonder to behold. <laughs> Who's told you that, Steve Lipson? <laughs> <laughs> and a pain to my cup. <laughs> I've, been, <laughs> I've been talking to the lads. Yeah, it's a tough one to my cup. So come on, tell us about the bass rig. No, and no, I just, you know, I look, look, one of my favourite bass players, you know, and, uh, it was Chris Squire. I always thought Chris Squire's early, you know, well, not even early. He still plays really well now, but just that whole way of playing um, is so exciting compared to you know most players play play with their fingers and 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 they have a pretty boring sound and they just thump away at the bottom and I mean somebody like you know for instance uh, um, who's the guy that plays with uh, Pink Floyd a lot? Uh, Tim Rennick. No, the other guy, um, the Australian guy, who used to play with Ice House. Um, Guy Pratt. Yeah. Guy Pratt's a really good bass player. He can play bass like amazing. With you. He can do that sort of uh, chic kind of playing. I can do a bit of that, but but it takes a, you know you, you, it takes a few years to get your fingers going that fast. And the problem when you play bass with your fingers as well, unless you're a really tight, spotless player. You know, when I, I I used to play the bass for a living in my twenties, and, and and you couldn't, uh, you 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 had to play with a pick because uh, certain certain songs were very difficult. Something like "Everlasting Love" by Love Affair was more or less impossible to play without a pick. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of it, so I use two amps basically. I use a high watt and an Ampeg, two big amps, and I put all the bottom on one and a load of top on the other. And it seems to work really well. It's like a hi-fi system with a lot of bottom and a lot of top. So even if I use effects, you know, like I use a bit of echo occasionally in chorus. and uh, A mini SSL lies at your feet, <laughs> I have quite. been told. <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite as complicated as that. So I use a few effects, but the way I do it is I just put the effects on the, on the, uh, on the top end. 
Yeah. Because that's the only place you need effects, really. But you're, you've always been very careful in your productions, and this was more apparent when Auratones adorned right. a console. So you've yeah. always been so careful, and it's always been so hard to explain to other musicians or producers. You've always been very careful about the actual bass notes in your productions, I've yeah. noticed. Oh, you're kidding, yeah. It's they've, absolutely... Yeah, they've been the right frequency to glow on the speakers because not every bass note glows on a well, small cone. Well, the the way you arrange a song and the key that you put it in will have far more effect on the uh, on the end result than the desk or the or where you put the microphone. Yeah. I mean, you can put the microphone where you like, but if the musicians aren't playing the right stuff, it makes no difference. I learned that pretty early on because, you know, when I started out, you had to cut this stuff onto vinyl, and vinyl, it wasn't the same as slapping it onto a CD where you can put as much level as you want and you can, the stereo can be as wide as possible. I used to show up for the sort of cutting sessions for vinyl, and I used to always cut with the same guy, Ian Cooper. He's still, he's still around, he's still yeah. cutting down at Townhouse, and he'd always give me a hard time. What load of rubbish have you got for me today? And he complained about the, uh, about the stereo image. And, because I had this thing where I used to like to put stuff left and right, really extreme left and really right. Really extreme. And, and extreme left and right and loud. And I used to say to him, well, I don't care if it distorts. Um, and he would say, you can't, you can't do that. And he'd put an elliptical... Elliptical equaliser, put the bass in the and middle. Pull it in. And then I'd moan about that. And then, you know, I remember on Slave to the Rhythm, there was one point where we panned the whole track left and yeah. right. There's only a little... Something in there. it's awful on the earbuds, on the yeah. It makes you fall over, yeah. But we sort of, me and Steve did that kind of, we were winding him up a little bit to see how he'd take it. I remember taking that down, and when he heard that, he was like, Right, you're not serious, are you? I gotta try and cut this onto a record. Um, so yeah, we, we, we sorry, I started that whole thing because you were asking me about the bass notes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, being a bass player, you know, you, I, 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 think, I think however well I thought I played the bass before I started making records, I realised pretty quickly, uh, once I started making records, that really the bass should be as simple as possible on 99% of the records that you make. Yeah. It should do the absolute bare minimum, but it has to be absolutely right. And keys make a big difference, and this, you know the sound of a bass guitar. The funny thing is, I don't often play bass on my own records. I didn't used to, you know. All of the Seal records, uh, a guy called Jamie Mahobrat, and all the bass is played on the keyboard, uh, apart from one track on the very last album that I played, that I played bass on. Yeah, I mean, you had a big team, and. You were unique for that at the time, and now it seems to have gone much more in the direction of it's almost do it yourself. The producer is expected to operate the workstation, the Pro yeah. Tools. That, I mean, do you see that as liberating, or is that more an encumbrance now? I mean, the thing, the thing is, I, having been a musician myself, I thought I, I always thought I had a pretty good idea of who could play and who couldn't. And and I figured that, that well, why should I play something on a record if I can find somebody who can play it better or much better? And I always got, I always got more pleasure from that than, than than trying. You know, if I spend all day trying to play something myself, I I don't know how good I feel. I kind of get more fun out of spending all day with somebody really really good playing all over my record and making it sound fabulous. Makes me feel better than me playing all day on something. Um, I don't like, I don't, you know, I never wanted um, my ability as a musician to to be an encumbrance to my ability as a producer. I think I'm capable of producing for a much, much wider range of records uh, than I am capable of playing on. You know, I can play the bass reasonably well in certain genres, but I would never regard myself as a great sort of funky bass player or a you know, if I was going to make a record like that, I'd use somebody who played in that style really well. And one of the things, you know, one of the things that I find sad about lots of the records I hear these days is that, you know, a lot of them are made on workstations and they're a bit dull. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, if you use, if you use, you know, I mean, I can I can bluff my way around on the keyboards reasonably well, but I can't play keyboards like Anne Dudley can play keyboards or like Jamie Mahobrak can. And you know, I wouldn't have back in the eighties. I suppose I could have played keyboards on my record, but it would have saved some money. <laughs> but I wouldn't have had Anne, and I would have missed her terribly. When someone's that good, you know that. The other thing, the other thing too is, if you if you get musicians in and you and you handle them right, like you you don't close them down by telling them what to play. And a lot of the time, I don't tell them what to play. I just play them the track and see what they come up with. And if you use the right people, ninety nine times out of a hundred, they'll come up with something way better than you can think of. You know. I hate it. I hate it when you when you get somebody in and you show them exactly what to play. Well, if if you want it exactly like that, you can play it yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. You don't need somebody. I've always valued musicians for their contributions, and and if there's something good about some of the records that I've ma I've made, a lot of it's down to them, really. You know. Although you know the function of a producer is to edit. You know, I'm 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 in the market for ideas. You know, I buy. It is important to, to to sort of control the overall thing, but but you know I would that's probably been the biggest thing that's the I suppose if if there's a secret would be that use the best musicians and then let them let them enjoy the session yeah rather than telling them what to play.